What is going on guys? Welcome back to another reaction video and tonight I'm going to check out a a bit of a different video uh, a, l a little bit I, I don't know if there, there might be some football players in this video But I think this is just more of a, uh, a sports video in general so it's um, and it's got to do with the uh, uh, with cheating so this one is titled 10 athletes who got caught cheating on live TV I think it's a relatively new video, so I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty excited to see it. Um, so yeah, I mean I think it's always quite it's interesting. I I mean I, I personally hate cheating, but uh, I I think it's just very interesting when you kind of see you know see it happen on live TV and then see you know what the reaction of the player is as well after they got caught. So that should be quite funny. Let's check it out. Despite what some fans may think, cheating in sports isn't limited to the teams or athletes they hate. Many look for any advantage they can get, and if that means bending or breaking the rules, so be it. But plenty get caught while doing so, and sometimes their cheating ways get exposed on live TV in front of everyone. Consequences varied, except for the court of public opinion deciding in each case that the athlete looked completely foolish trying to sneak around the rule book. Here are ten athletes across the sports spectrum who tried to cheat and got caught in front of millions, thanks to the magic of live television. <laughs> Aussie men's cricket team, I know all about this one. Sort of cricket doesn't often deal with crazy scandals. Definitely. Until March 2018 anyway. That was when several members of the men's Australian cricket team got caught cheating and sent the entire squad's reputation through the shredder. During a match against South Africa, television cameras caught Aussie bowler Cameron Bancroft appearing to rub the ball with some strange substance, which turned out to be sandpaper. Umpires were notified and confronted him, but they didn't penalize him since he hadn't gotten around to messing with the ball in any influential way. But he tried to, and he wasn't alone. It soon came out that team captains Steve Smith and David Warner ordered Bancroft to rub the ball with sandpaper, thereby making it easier to swing the ball. This is essentially cricket speak for a curveball. After a brief investigation, not to mention an irate phone call from the Aussie Prime Minister, Cricket Australia <laughs> pulled out their punishments. Since they were the uh, brains behind the operation, Smith and Warner received one-year bans from professional cricket. I remember this, lost man. 100% of their pay for the game in question. Bancroft didn't get off scot-free, receiving a nine-month suspension and losing 75% of his game money. He only returned to pro cricket in December 2018. Then there's the coach, Darren Lemon, who was found to have taken no part in the scandal and received no punishment, except from himself. He resigned as coach, declaring that Aussie cricket needed to move forward. It's hard to do that when a coach who lost control to such a degree sticks around, even after the cheaters sat on the sidelines. Flipping Aussies. <laughs> as much as baseball fans love the late 90s home run race between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, both players have essentially been blackballed from the sport for using performance enhancing drugs to boost their power. But I'm not talking about that, since Sosa certainly wasn't dumb enough to do steroids on camera. However, in June 2003, he was caught red-handed with a cheat that only added to his rapidly crumbling reputation. After hitting a ball hard enough to break his bat, umpires noticed cork popping out of the bat. Corked bats are notorious for making it easier to hit for power, and are completely against the rules. Oh. Sosa was immediately ejected, becoming only the sixth player since 1970 to get caught using a corked bat. He later earned an eight-game suspension for his offense, tied for the longest cork-related punishment in history. Sosa later appealed the suspension down to seven games, as officials accepted his claim that he mistakenly used a practice bat he had corked to look cool for the crowd during pre-game warm-ups. His seeming sincerity, coupled with the tests of 76 of Sosa's bats finding zero cork among them, convinced the powers that be that Sosa didn't mean to cheat. But who knows if that's true? It's all but accepted he cheated to hit all those home runs. And once you see one court bat, it's hard not to suspect he's been corking throughout his career. We may never know for sure, though considering Sosa still isn't in the Hall of Fame and likely never will be, the court of public opinion has clearly found him guilty on all accounts. Man. Reputation gone, eh? In recent years, cheating in football has largely been centered around the usage of PEDs, deflated footballs, and spying on teams during practice. But in 2010, a coach for the New York Jets embraced another fun way to cheat at pigskin tripping opponents like a schoolyard bully. In a game what? against the Miami Dolphins, Jets strength and conditioning coach Sal Alosi decided to give his team an advantage by injuring the closest Dolphin. So he stuck his knee out onto the field, tripping Dolphins quarterback Nolan Carroll and sending him tumbling to the turf. 
He wasn't hurt much and actually returned to the game later on, but it wound up being a terrible look for Elosi and the Jets. Even the CBS commentators remarked that this is just uncalled for in the NFL, and that whoever tripped Carroll should be ashamed of themselves. They were, as Elosi quickly admitted it was him, and that he tripped Carroll on purpose. He claimed it was a total lapse in judgment and that he was willing to accept whatever punishment the team deemed necessary. It wound up being a doozy of a punishment. Elosi found himself suspended for the rest of the season, including the playoffs, where the Jets made it to the AFC Championship. He was also fined $25,000. Resigned from the Jets in January 2011 and hasn't worked in the NFL since. Oh, and the Jets lost that game appropriately enough. Oh, man. Soccer is as much theater as it is a sport, judging by how many players attempt to gain an advantage through flopping, or acting like contact hurt way more than it actually did. If successful, the other team gets penalized and the suddenly healthy player gets up what and keeps on doing? playing. However, a successful flop should be somewhat oh. based on reality. Something Brazil's Rivaldo Ferreira didn't even attempt in June 2002. In a game against Turkey, I remember this. player Hakan Unsal kicked the ball toward Ferreira. I saw this live. His shin, but Ferreira decided to act otherwise. He collapsed to the ground, screaming and holding his face. The officials, seeing Ferreira in such supposed pain, ejected Unsal from the game and slapped Turkey with a penalty. Such antics may well have helped the Brazilians win the match 2-1. But Ferreira apparently forgot instant replay and giant screens exist, because shortly after the penalty, the stadium screen replayed the incident, clearly showing the ball didn't come remotely close to Ferreira's face. He couldn't deny anything and thus admitted to the cheat, though he peppered his admission with a healthy dash of remorseless victim blaming. As he explained, the ball touched my leg, but the other player was still wrong to kick the ball at me. I said sorry to him, but that's football. It may not have hit my face, but the Turkish player should not have done that in the first place. FIFA wasted little time in punishing Ferreira, though they didn't go very far. They merely find him 11,500 Swiss francs, which is roughly the same amount in US dollars. If you're wondering why flopping keeps happening in soccer, wrist slap punishments like that might well be why. Trust me, believe me, as a soccer player all my life, this is one part of what fo I call it football. This is this is the football that I know and love. I hate diving. I hate, you guys call it flopping, I think. Yeah, anyway, or any, like most of the world call it diving. But in recent years, it's been sort of, it still happens, don't get me wrong, but it's kind of, um, it's, it's, a, it's happening a little less now because players do get yellow cards, and not only that, uh, they've got VAR, which is Video Assistant Referee, so they go through replays, you know, for like red card offences and really bad tackles, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely improving, but de don't get me wrong, that is one part of soccer that I have just absolutely hated, even though it's been my favourite sport. Oh yeah, the hand of God. I know this one. Even if you're a casual soccer fan, you've likely heard about the hand of God. But here's the entire story behind one of the most famous goals and one of the most famous cheats of all time. Must have been such a blind referee. In the quarterfinals of the 1986 World Cup. After 51 scoreless minutes, Argentina's Diego Maradona kicked the ball toward England's goal, where goalkeeper Peter Shilton was waiting to knock the ball away. He, as a goalkeeper, could use his hands to do that. Maradona, as a striker, could not, but he did so anyway. As Shilton went to punch the ball away from the goal, Maradona leapt into the air and punched it back in. The referee somehow didn't see the cheat and allowed the goal to stand, starting Argentina on the path to a 2-1 win and eventual World Cup championship victory over Mexico. Fake World Cup Maradona won. was asked about the goal, since replays clearly showed he used his hands. He claimed the goal happened thanks to a little with the head of Maradona and a little with the hand of God, giving rise to the term hand of God. Years later, in 2005, Maradona admitted he did it on purpose and knew immediately he had cheated. In fact, he told USA Today he needed his team to help him distract the referee afterward, explaining I was waiting for my teammates to embrace me and no one came. I told them, come hug me or the referee isn't going to allow it. Maradona was swiftly punished for both cheating and manipulating the official by yep. getting away with absolutely everything. Taking drugs. Got no respect for that guy, Maradona. It's never None smart whatsoever. to cheat during a marathon or triathlon. There are cameras and data everywhere, and even without that, all officials need to do is look at someone's time to see if their accomplishment seems on the up and up. In the case of Julie Miller, she wasn't even close. Miller came out of seemingly nowhere to win Ironman Canada in July 2015. This made no sense to the other runners, particularly super athlete Suzanne Davis, who was favored to win and had eyewitnesses aplenty insisting she had. No one, meanwhile, had seen Miller in the lead ever, except suddenly she was first past the marathon finish line. Something seemed fishy, especially since Miller didn't stick around to shake hands or anything. It was almost like she wanted to disappear as quickly as she appeared. Davis and her fellow runners conducted an investigation, studying photographs, videos, and official time data, along with interviewing eyewitnesses to the race. 
Their conclusion, one eventually shared by the Iron Man board, was that few saw Miller race because she basically didn't. She simply darted in and out of the course, cutting out large swaths of her path and keeping her fresh as could be while approaching the finish line. For this, Iron Man Canada <laughs> disqualified Miller from the race, along with two others she supposedly won before. Sneaky, Chris man. Davis is the winner, which she clearly had been the entire time. Miller still insists she won the race fairly, but at this point, with all the proof exposing her as a cheater, her arguments are about as legitimate as a child insisting they're not stealing cookies while their hand is in the jar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. The story of ex-boxer Louis Resto isn't so much a tale of cheating as it is a one of near murderous assault. In 1983, Resto fought the undefeated Billy Collins and unexpectedly beat him senseless. After 10 rounds, Collins' Ooh. face was beyond swollen and his eyes were all but shut. His father and trainer Billy Sr. cried foul after shaking Resto's hands and realizing the gloves felt thin. Sure enough, it turned out Resto's trainer Panama Lewis had removed padding from the gloves, making Resto's punches stronger than they had any right to be. The New York State Boxing Commission concluded Resto knew the gloves were tampered with and suspended him for a year. Worse for Resto, he and Lewis actually went on trial for felonious assault, since getting punched out with illegal gloves was not what Collins signed up for. Found guilty, Resto served two and a half years in prison. Whoa. Over 20 years later in 2007, Resto finally admitted he knew the gloves were tainted. Worse, he confessed to other cheats, like having his hand wraps soaked in plaster, basically turning his hands into rocks. Oh. He also admitted Lewis would give him water spiked with asthma medicine. This illegally increased his lung power, which came in handy late in fights while clean boxers struggled to catch their breath. In short, Virtually everything about Resto and his career was phony. One Man. thing that was very real and very tragic is Collins' fate. Due to eyesight damage suffered in the Resto fight, Collins had to retire. Months later, he Aww. drove drunk and crashed his car, an accident that killed him. His father maintains that Collins might have intentionally driven drunk and essentially killed himself, feeling his career and life were over because of what Resto did to him. Far out, man. That was horrific. What a horrible ending. Spitball, where a pitcher would literally spit on a ball to make it curve and difficult to hit, is long dead. But that hasn't stopped pitchers from making the ball curve in different ways. The problem is, unless their method is getting better at throwing a curveball, chances are they're doing something illegal. That's what happened to Michael Pineda in 2014. The Yankees pitcher decided the best way to handle the Red Sox was to smear pine tar on his hands and neck. He did it twice in two weeks, and the first time it resulted in a 4-1 Yankees win. But to viewers, it quickly became evident that he had substance on his hands. By the fifth inning, social media had talked so much about it that even the commentators brought it up. However, by the time Sox management inquired about it, Pineda had wiped his hands clean, what? and so no punishment could be doled out. When asked about it afterward, he dismissed charges of pine tar cheating with, it's just dirt, nothing to see here. A couple weeks later, <laughs> also against the Sox, Pineda used his so-called dirt again, except this time the umpires knew to look for it. They caught him using it in just the second inning, and threw him out of the game. He later received a lengthy 10-game suspension for his troubles. Amazingly, Pineda's real sin, as far as his fellow baseball players were concerned, wasn't that he cheated, but that he did it so flagrantly. Several Several players defended Pineda, saying up to 90% of pitchers use pine tar, rosin, sunscreen, and whatever else they can find to help grip the ball better on chilly days. What? They don't consider it cheating, but they did consider Pineda's flaunting of the stuff to be fairly stupid. That's crazy. When athletes get caught cheating, there's several routes they can take. They can admit to it and apologize, they can deny it, or they can even ignore it. The NBA's Dwight Howard took a novel approach to being exposed as a cheater. He admitted it, admitted to doing it all the time, insisted it was no big deal, and acted like being called a cheater was just ridiculous. In March 2016, Howard's Houston Rockets were playing the Atlanta Hawks. Shortly after Howard made a layup, the Hawks' Paul Millsap went for a couple free throws. But while doing so, he noticed the ball felt stickier than he'd ever felt it before. He handed it to the referee, who brought it over to the scorer's table. There, he discovered a tape-covered can of what turned out to be stickum, an adhesive that many athletes used in the 1970s to help grip the ball easier. <laughs> However, it's been banned for a long time now, meaning Dwight Howard was using an illegal substance to cheat. Somehow, nobody really knows how a sticky basketball makes it easier to win, since Howard still had to handle the ball himself. Whatever his reason, Howard clearly felt this was no big deal. As he told the Houston Chronicle, I've been using it for the last five years. It hasn't been a problem. I don't know why people are making a big deal out of it. I do it every game. It's not a big deal. Yes, Dwight Howard defended himself against charges of cheating by admitting he cheated, admitting he had done what? so for years, and challenging anyone to care about it. The NBA apparently did not. Yeah, how would a sticky bowl help be possible? Least. Maybe they were so taken aback by his brazenness, they decided to just give him this one. Number one. Thanks to Lance Armstrong, Whoops. the sport of bike racing has a reputation for being filled with cheaters. Bicycling is so grueling, it's extremely difficult to... Who doesn't know about Lance Armstrong? ...routine rule-breaking. But it's not all doping like Armstrong. 
Sometimes, like with Vincenzo Nibali, it's as simple a matter as grabbing hold of a vehicle and letting it move you instead of doing the work yourself. Dude. In summer 2015, Nibali, a former Tour de France champion, competed in the Vuelta a España, a Spanish bike race. At one point, he found himself involved in a crash, and as a result, he was far behind the rest of the pack. Rather than simply bike harder, he and his team employed a technique known as the sticky bottle. Basically, a rider will gain a brief advantage by having his team drive up to him to give him a bottle of water. In the few seconds both the driver and cyclist are holding the bottle, the car drifts the cyclist along without having to do anything. That's more or less allowed, if not really endorsed by the rules. <laughs> However, Nibali's version of the sticky bottle was so blatant, officials simply couldn't look the other way. He grabbed hold of the car itself, which then zoomed him all the way up to the other cyclists. This extended free ride was simply too much, too unacceptable to Vuelta officials, who promptly disqualified Nibali and sent him packing. To make things more embarrassing for Nibali, he didn't even win as a result of his cheating. After rejoining the pack, he lost contact yet again, and ultimately finished 31st out of the roughly 160 cyclists. Getting punished for a cheat that didn't really help you much is a good definition of a bad day. <laughs> Definitely is, but man, just the, the ways that they were coming up with, uh, you know, to, to think to cheat, it's just like they, they went so far out of their way to get that, you know, that minute advantage. It's just ridiculous. It's like... Man, why don't you just go out and train harder or, you know, do some, you know, practice harder or whatever. It's just like, like you're just doing all this stupid stuff to just seriously get the tiniest. And I suppose, I mean, you know, in professional sports, I mean, an advantage like that could mean, but you know, be the difference between a win and a loss. So, you know, I can understand that, but still, just the whole act of it is just, just stupid. And I mean, you know, and also... The other thing is that there there have probably been hundreds and if not thousands of cheaters in professional sports that have never been caught. So, you know, it's just one of those things. But yeah, as the title suggests, got caught cheating on live TV. So and you know, m most of them admitted to it, which was good. But you know, obviously, these guys have have uh, you know pretty big egos and whatnot. So, you know, it must be pretty humbling for them. But <laughs> there you have it, guys. That's uh, just a little interesting uh, side side street I went down uh, on my channel here. So I might do a few more of these as well, just uh, more sports related stuff like this. And uh, that's it, guys. So let me know. Well, let me know if you guys have any suggestions for videos like this um, that are similar to this. And uh, you know, I'll definitely I'll definitely give them a look. And yeah, so smash the like button, guys. Comment down below and subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll see you on the next one. See you later.